Good morning. Good morning. We have a record turnout for you this morning. Great. A blowout crowd. My name is Stephen Shankland. I'm a technology reporter at CNET News. I've been here for 18 years. I've covered just about everything. PCs, supercomputers, microprocessors, software, uh, apps, programming, the works over the years. And over the last decade or so, I've concentrated in part on digital photography. So I've been looking at that uh, technology and those products, software, the hardware, for uh, 10 years or so now. And uh, that's one reason I find the iPhone 7 Plus particularly interesting. So I'm going to be talking about that a lot today, of course. Uh, I'm going to uh, cover a few things here. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about just the general cameras uh, on the iPhone 7 Plus Step 2. Then I'm going to be talking in more detail about the portrait mode that those two cameras enable, which is really interesting and just arrived on Monday. And then I'm going to dig deeper into the technology called computational photography, which is a pet subject I'm particularly interested in. It, it really uh, profoundly changes how cameras work, especially on smartphones. Uh, I'm going to be this is uh, you know, geared for a general audience, but there's obviously going to be some technology term and some camera and photography jargon. If you have any questions uh, about the terminology or anything else, feel free to just interrupt uh, and uh, I'll answer the questions as we go along. Hopefully we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So that's, uh, that's kind of the rough plan today. If anybody has a question as uh as we're going through this, uh, feel comfortable to raise your hand. You know, yeah, raise your hand. Okay. George can interrupt me. I can uh, uh, pause and we can deal with it. So I guess just to put this into context, uh, I've been a photographer for many years. I'm a professional photographer now. I'm mostly a writer, but I also do a lot of photojournalism, and I just enjoy it as a hobby as well. So I take a lot of photos, most of this big, giant, bulky, unpleasant SLR. But it means a lot to me, so I carry that sucker around. Uh, and in the early days of smartphone photography, the image quality was just bad. It was useful enough that you'd use it sometimes in emergencies. I was really impressed at how the image quality has improved in the performance of the cameras overall. And uh, the iPhone 7 Plus is obviously uh, the pinnacle of Apple's uh, achievements in smartphone photography. I've also been using, where do I have it somewhere around here? Uh, Google Pixel, which is another interesting camera phone. We can talk about that more later if you're interested in it. Uh, but what's, what's particularly interesting to me is as the image quality has improved, I really see it as it's changed two dimensions. For shutter bugs, people who like taking photos a lot, like me, it's really transformed what you can do. So for example, yesterday I was covering a speech by an executive at a Silicon Valley conference. I had my big camera with a big super telephoto lens on for the for the wide shots. They had to pull off the lens and put on a new lens for the for the wide angle shots, you know, so I can switch through telephoto and wide angle. But yesterday I just pulled out my phone and took half the shots with my phone, which is a nice wide angle, and half the shots with my SLR. The image quality has gotten good enough that Professionals can use it for a lot of these circumstances. Uh, so that's been really interesting. Uh, one trend where the photography enthusiasts have embraced smartphone photography. The other interesting trend is, of course, that ordinary people who don't necessarily have a particular passion for photography, they also have really embraced smartphone photography. They like to take photos, they like to share them with their friends and family, and uh, some of them get a little passion or a little creative buzz out of it. Apple really likes to capitalize on that with its uh, advertisements, the shot on iPhone uh, ads. I think they really speak to me, and I really enjoy looking at those photos. So uh, the ordinary photographer <coughs> has really benefited a lot from the improvements in camera quality, To Really, is one of the most important features on a camera. And really, if you're, you know, for example, looking at upgrading from last year's iPhone, as far as I can tell, really the only real reason to do it is, is the camera. <coughs> so. Uh, that's kind of the, the general wavelength. Photography is really important as a component of, uh, a, a, of a, a component of a phone. 
Uh, now, the iPhone, uh, like I say, has been particularly successful with photographers. A lot of the early apps like Instagram initially were only available for iPhone. And if you look at the Flickr photo sharing site, the top of the top five cameras, four of them are iPhone. So uh, there's a lot of activity when you have that ability to shoot and then just share immediately. People like to do things with their photos. So it's no surprise Apple and everybody else is investing in smartphone cameras. It used to be Apple was head and shoulders above the competition. Now it's really neck and neck. That's wonderful in my opinion. Uh, and there are some things I like better about Apple's, some about other uh, competitors. We can get into that a little bit more later if you are interested. Uh, so to nobody's surprise, the iPhone 7 Plus is the best Apple camera out there so far. And uh, it's got a lot of interesting features that distinguish it from what was on last year with the 6S, 6S Plus. So uh, just, maybe just, a, just, I don't know if you guys have watched the keynotes and such, but uh, I'll get into some of the details. So there, there's some improvements. It's still 12 megapixel sensor. And so that hasn't changed. But you get more bang for your buck. Each pixel is a little bit better. <clears throat> so one interesting change was the lens technology. So you get in a camera, in a digital camera, you have the image sensor, which is a tiny little chip that actually gathers the light, and then you have lens elements in front of that sensor. And with uh, the iPhone 7, Apple went from five lens elements to six lens elements, which, you know, if I go off six is better than five, but there actually is a real reason to do that. You can get better sharpness, you can reduce optical problems like chromatic aberration and distortion. Distortion, you might, you know, like barrel distortion, you have two parallel lines in the, in, in the scene and they come out looking bowed like this. That's called barrel distortion. Just get pin cushion distortion. So when you have more lens elements, you can correct for problems like that better. So that's uh, one interesting change. The lens also is brighter, faster, and has a wider aperture. That means it lets in more light. So last year it was f2.2 lens. This year it's an f1.8 lens, which means it lets in more than uh, more than 50 percent more light. So that really helps when you're shooting in low light situations. You can just gather more light. And <clears throat> excuse me, the new phone also has an Apple designed image sensor, uh, image processor. Excuse me, Sony does the image sensor, but Apple does the image processor. This is an important ancillary chip that's instrumental in actually taking the photo. It helps decide what the exposure should be, it <coughs> noise, the little speckles of noise that can degrade an image, especially when you're shooting when it's dim. And uh, it handles a lot of sort of the, the nuts and bolts of actually taking the photo. It's really interesting to me that Apple has decided to invest in this and make its own image processor. Uh, it, there are any number of companies you can buy image processors off the shelf. But Apple has said, specifically over the last few years, that when there's something that's really important to it, it wants to control that technology. That's why it now designs its own processors, uh, for example, the A10 processor. So you'll see Apple, when it's when it's a really critical component, Apple will design it in-house by itself. And the image processor is now one of those components. So it got a big promotion this year. That really signals how important photography is to Apple and how it thinks how important it thinks it is to its customers. Uh, another interesting change, this is more cosmetic, but there's the camera bump here on the back. Everybody hates the camera bump, but really uh, it's pretty hard to avoid because if you want to get high quality images, you need a relatively large image sensor. And if you have a relatively large image sensor, you need relatively large lens in front of that. On top of that, you have image stabilization that adds a little bit of bulk and so what Apple did this year was they embraced the hump, which means they actually machined it very nicely. It, it feels integrated with the camera, I mean with the phone, excuse me. I personally, uh, some people still hate it, I personally don't bother it, but as you can see, I wrap my phone up in a giant, bulky, ugly case. So it's, it's not even, nothing for food. So for me, it's, it's not an issue. And, 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 I, and to me, photo quality is important enough that even if it were, it, I, I would accept the bump happily. Interestingly, uh, with the Google Pixel, there is no bump, but that's because they made it slightly wedge-shaped, so it's thicker at the top and thinner at the bottom, different design, design decisions, so it's smooth. I haven't got my case yet for that, I better not drop. 
So uh, another big change coming from the iPhone 6S and 6S Plus, the iPhone 7 and 7 Plus, is optical image stabilization. Last year, there was optical image stabilization only on the 6S Plus, a big phone. Now we have it on both the 7 and the 7 Plus. What optical, there, let's just step back, there are two types of image stabilization. Both of them do the same thing, which is they try to compensate for your shaky hands. So if you're taking a photo when it's dark or just under any circumstances, really, but especially when it's dim, the camera shakes. The longer the shutter stays open, the more likely it is that you're going to get a blurry image. Image stabilization compensates for that, so you can take a photo with a slower shutter speed. The shutter can stay open longer, the sensor can gather more light, you get a better photo. So optical image stabilization actually moves elements of the camera back and forth very rapidly to compensate and essentially reverse the effect of your camera shake. That works both if you're taking a photo or if you're taking a video when you tend to uh, you know, shake the camera when you're walking or panning. So the image stabilization is a very important feature and now it's on both of the Apple uh, iPhones, the 7 and the 7 Plus. That's really a terrific improvement. One interesting debate is whether optical image stabilization is better than digital image stabilization. With digital image stabilization, the sensor doesn't move, or excuse me, the uh, lens elements don't move, but you can compensate digitally, I, in other words, with, with uh, processing the image data to get rid of the motion blur. So if, if the, you move the camera up a little bit, the, uh, com the computer and the camera will uh, grab some of the data from elsewhere in the frame and, and compensate for how your camera is moving. So you take a bigger frame and you just take a patch, of the central patch of the image data. And so that's a good way of compensating for camera motion too. But in my opinion, it's not as good as optical image stabilization. One of the problems with digital image stabilization is that uh, it works okay with, for example, 1080p video, regular high definition video. But if you're doubling the frame rate to 60 frames per second, or if you're going to 4K video, then the computer has to do a lot more work to do that digital stabilization. And it might not necessarily be able to keep up. So that's a situation where optical image stabilization is better. You get the image stabilization for free, it doesn't matter. If you're shooting at 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second, 1080p video, or 4K video, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm a fan of optical stabilization. Uh, nice thing about digital image stabilization, though, is you can improve it with a firmware update. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, not handy. And I should add that they are not mutually exclusive. You can do both, and I believe that Apple does do both, even though it has optical image stabilization. It also uses digital stabilization in some circumstances. It also uh, can be handy if you're shooting with the front-facing camera, which uh, doesn't have optical stabilization. I think the coolest improvement by far in the iPhone 7 generation is the dual lens design. It has two lenses, you can't see very well here, but it's got on the outside, excuse me, on the outside it's got a relatively wide angle 28 millimeter lens. That's 50 in, in conventional SLR terms, it's not actually 28 millimeters. Anyway, it's got the 28 millimeter lens and then uh, closer to the center of the phone it's got a 56 millimeter lens. That's more telephoto. It's not strictly speaking telephoto, but it's, uh, it, it's really good for portraits especially, but also for landscape shots that can bring in mountains so they're a little bit closer. And it's, I find it very handy. It addresses one of my biggest complaints about mobile phone photography and one of the reasons I often would just go back to my SLR, which is zoom. If you have a mobile phone camera and all it can do is a wide angle view that's fixed, then it's really limiting. You can get a lot done with it, it's good for a lot of cases, but then for somebody like me who does a lot of other types of photography, it's really, it's really unpleasant. So I was really happy to see Apple take this approach with the two lenses. It's very easy to switch between the two cameras. Uh, on the screen, you'll see a little circle that says 1x when you turn on the camera app. If you tap the 1x, it, it changes to 2x and it switches from the wide angle view to the more telephoto view 56 millimeter camera. And then if you tap it again, it goes back to the wide angle view. And one feature actually I really like quite a lot is if you hold down on that little button, it turns into a slider and you can drag your finger up and down. It's like, like twisting a dial. And that slides seamlessly from 1x all the way up to 10x. 
So it's a very nicely implemented Zoom feature. Some people like pinch Zoom, not me. I, prefer, I actually like this a lot better. I find it easier to control. Uh, pinch and Zoom is, eh, it's just hard to hold the camera and get exactly the level of Zoom you want. I find this more precise and it's, uh, it works very well. Of course, with 1x, you're using the wide angle camera. With 2x, you're using the ball focus camera, 56 millimeter camera. What happens at 5x or 10x is you're looking only at the center portion of the image sensor data. It just crops the image and then magnifies that. And as we all know, despite any number of TV shows, uh, you can't actually make up data that way. So that doesn't work as well as a real telephoto zoom. I'll show you uh, an image later. I've got a little, uh, some images I'm gonna, I'll be sharing with you. Actually, don't do that right now, just, you might be curious. Um, let me get those uh, images up. But this was from a, a couple mornings ago. I went out and I had my uh, SLR. Let me just get this set up. I had my SLR and uh, I took a, a photo of the moon in the morning, which is a pretty difficult shot to take uh, with any kind of camera because uh, the moon will be bright, the sky will be damp, you'll get things that are washed out. Uh, let's see, share screen. So here are the photos, the two photos I took. Can you see that okay? Not yet. Mm. Oh wait, I click the start button as well. All right, there you go. So I'm not sure how good the image quality is here, but on the, on the uh, left side is the photo I took with the iPhone, and on the right side is the photo I took with my SLR uh, frame, so the moon was about the same size. And that's, that's what the iPhone set at 10x zooms. So as you can see, there's a lot of noise speckles, and there's not nearly as much detail. So then if we zoom in all the way, you can see there's vastly more detail, vastly less noise with the SLR image. So while I really appreciate that we are um, uh, improving the zoom abilities on smartphones, it's, it's still, as I see it, baby steps. So there's some interesting technological approaches that might uh, come later with other improvements. But uh, hang on, stop sharing screen. So we can talk about that more later if you want, but uh, it's suffice it to say that although it's pretty remarkable what you can do, it's still uh, definitely limited. Uh, another gripe I have uh, with the iPhone 7 is that the wide angle is only 28 millimeters wide. I often shoot very wide. My SLR has a 16 millimeter lens, which is much wider field of view. It would have been nice if they had gone with 24, 25 millimeters, something a bit more uh, helpful if you're shooting indoors or shooting a big crowd of people and you can't back up. It's kind of a nitpick, uh, but I find when I'm comparing it to other phones like the Pixel, the Google Pixel, which has a wider angle lens, I actually like that better. Another gripe, and this is more serious, is with the 56 millimeter lens, there are two differences that it has versus the one, the uh, 28 millimeter lens. The first is there's no optical image stabilization, which is unfortunate because uh, your camera, your phone or any kind of camera is more susceptible to image shape with telephoto lenses. The longer the focal length, the more a little wobble of your hand is going to be magnified on the sensor. So that's unfortunate, but it's not a surprise because adding that image stabilization uh, hardware in there makes the camera bulkier, and there's only so much volume on the iPhone. Okay. Another uh, Hold on just a second, we have a question. Sure. Yeah, I don't know if it was a presenter talking about an older iPhone or I read this, but I recall somebody said the only reason to zoom in on your phone is to get a lesser quality image and you should edit the picture in your phone instead of zooming. That's not true? You mean crop it? Crop it, crop it, yeah. It's, it's a little bit boomy. It sounded like your question was, there's no good reason to zoom in on a photo with your uh, with your phone. And uh, so in general, the answer to that, in my opinion, is yes. If you're taking a photo you care about, you're not gonna get any better a photo zooming in on your photo and taking a photo then versus just taking a regular photo and then maybe cropping later and then 
blowing up the pixels with Photoshop or Apple Photos or some other software. You can't make up the data. So if you're cropping the central portion of the frame to zoom in and then expanding that central portion of the frame, you, you're, you're doing some math, some interpolation, and you just can't make, it doesn't magically make a, a sharper image. There are a lot of situations when I find it useful to do that zooming, but if it's a, if it's a photo I care about, it's just not going to be that great. So I, I, I'll do it, you know, for example, if I want to get a photo of a, a slide that somebody's giving on the screen for some presentation that has some information, I'll be you know, reporting on some event, some speaker gives a slide, I can take a photo of the slide, it's good enough that I can read the, read the information, but it's not good enough that I can publish the photo or uh, think it's very good. But what is changing with the iPhone 7 Plus is that it has the two cameras, and with the two cameras, you can't zoom in significantly. So you can only uh, uh, you can't go all the way to 10x without making data, but with the second camera, that 10x is the equivalent of 5x. So you're making up you're still making up data, but you're not making as much up. And uh, actually, I can show you another image here if uh, if I have it here. Uh, Stephen. Yes. Let me ask you a question. On, um, I thought I read on the seven on the seven plus that if you're at 2x, that's optical zoom, and anything after that is digital zoom. That is correct. So at 2x, you're using the telephoto lens. At 1x, you're using the wide-angle lens. If you're going anything beyond 2x, it's cropping the center of the frame and expanding the, the, the data mathematically, not optically. So yes, you are, you'll get you won't get nearly as much information. So you might, it still might be worth it for you just because uh, it's, it's a nicer framing, but don't expect miracles here. It's, it's not the same as a real camera with a real zoom lens, optical zoom lens. So yes, basically uh, it's not as good. I'm gonna show you a photo here. This is one I took at 10X. So you can see here that uh, if you look here at, 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 I don't know how well this comes through on Skype, but all these uh, silhouetted trees down here at the bottom, it's very blocky and smeary. It looks kind of like watercolor. That's the kind of artifacts you get when you're doing this digital zoom. And uh, you know, it's, it's not a terrible photo, but it's nothing spectacular. Uh, the digital zoom is not a free lunch. So, uh, let's see, moving on, I guess the, the next thing though, the thing that, uh, so, so the zoom is nice, it's handy, I use it a lot, uh, but what I think is more interesting with the, uh, the two cameras is that it enables this new feature that just shipped Monday called portrait mode. So if you're shooting with the camera, there are lots of different modes, photo, video, slow-mo, time-lapse, square, panorama. With the new version of iOS 10.1, there's now another option there called portrait. When you take that portrait, when you use that portrait mode, what it does is it, it does some mathematical processing to the image and it produces what Apple calls the depth effect. The short version of that is if you take a picture of a person, that person will be in sharp focus, but the background behind them will be nicely blurred out. That's an effect that has been physically impossible to achieve with smartphones. The basic problem is that when you have a small image sensor, you get deep depth of field. So stuff in the foreground and stuff in the background are both in focus. Nice, taking a landscape photo, you want to have the flowers in the foreground in focus, you want to have the mountains in the background in focus, but it's not good when you're taking a portrait because then you'll have distraction action, you'll have like, trees, you'll have power lines, you'll have other people, and if, if that background blurs out, then it really focuses your attention effectively on the subject. I'm going to show you a couple examples here. Uh, so this is um, something you can do nicely with an SLR, and it's one of the reasons I still shoot a lot in SLR. So here is an example here. This is actually, curiously, it's a photo of a Google Pixel, and you can see the uh, the the, the, uh, the camera itself is in sharp focus. Excuse me, the phone is in sharp focus. Oh, that just woke up Google. <laughs> um, you can see the camera's in focus. The guy who's holding the camera uh, 
is uh, in soft focus, but you can tell it's a human being. And then the stuff behind him, the, the sunlight coming through the trees, is kind of this nice model pattern that's called bokeh, B-O-K-E-H. That's talking about sort of the nature of the background blur. And something that photographers really like is that nice creamy bokeh. Uh, here's another example. So you see the kid getting an haircut is in focus. The barber is, you can still tell there's a barber there, but it really concentrates your attention on the barber. The, uh, the last picture of the, of the uh, child, was that with an SLR? Or the, the yeah, this is all shot with an SLR. So okay. I'm just I'm, I'm setting the context here. Here's another example. This is a shot I took of a, a bike that I was testing, an electric bike. And uh, you can see that you know it helps the, uh, the photo pop a little bit. Whoops, excuse me. You can see the bike is sharp, concentrates your attention on it, but the background is soft. And that's something that's really pretty hard to achieve with a smartphone. So what Apple does, though, is with this portrait mode, is it will actually, uh, excuse me here, it will actually unblur the background so that you can see, excuse me, it will blur the background so you can concentrate the attention on, on, on the human being that you're trying to take a photo of. It works with a lot of other things. Uh, it doesn't always work well with other things, but it actually specifically registers whether there's a face or a body, so it knows pretty well what it should be focusing on. That's kind of a, a nice feature. And uh, it doesn't always work. Uh, sometimes you get artifacts, but generally speaking, it works pretty well. And if, if you compare, when you, take, uh, when you take a portrait mode photo, the camera actually records two photos, one with the effect and one without the effect. And if you compare back and forth, you can find lots of defects. So you can find stray hairs that disappear, or uh, you know somebody's chin is in profile, but a sharp contrast, a sharp focused chin will get soft. So they're defects, but my opinion, you know, unless you're really pixel peeping, looking at it up close, it works very well. So I think I think it's a tremendous improvement. If you take pictures of people a lot, uh, it's worth the $120 price difference right there, if you're gonna keep your phone for two, two years or three years, that one piece alone is worth it for upgrading from the seven to the seven plus. Because of course the iPhone seven just has a single camera and it can't do portrait mode. Uh, there's some other cameras that have done this before, like the Huawei P9 that came out earlier this year. In my opinion, it doesn't do as good a job. Apple really, it's, it's pretty impressive. I'm gonna show you an example here with, um, Here's a good example. Okay, so here's one. Uh, let me share the screen. This is a photo I took of my son a little while back. And uh, okay, so here you can see the. Uh, this is the photo I took without the portrait mode. So you can see that the background is not, you know, he's close. The background is a little bit soft. It's not. It's not terribly distracting. But then when you apply the portrait mode, which I just did, this is the next one, you can see the background really softens up. So with this is the original photo, and the background, you know, you, you, I find my eye, I start looking at the green plant here and the patterns in the trail, other things. This is with the portrait mode view. I just don't look at any of it. I just, all my attention goes straight to the kid. So I find it very effective. Uh, particular uh, a little this, bit under exposed. This was taken with the iPhone. Correct. That was taken with the iPhone 7 Plus. Here's another example here. Uh, so this is a shot I took this weekend. And again, this is the shot without the portrait mode. And this isn't too bad because the background is far away and pretty even that nice sky. So you're not going to notice as much of a difference. But look at the, the wheel you can see under on the bottom right of the, of the screen. You can see there's a car wheel there. And it kind of it's distracting. It's right where the, this little object he's noodling with is, so you can't quite tell if it's there or not. Now here's the portrait mode version, also shot again with an iPhone. And you can see that background wheel just blurs away. Whoops, hang on. So it works pretty well. Let me uh, do a comparison here. You can, here, I'll just zoom into this sec. So in this one, it's actually interesting. Uh, 
you can see the wheel there, there's a little straw in front of it. Here's the straw. Here's the wheel. And then there's this little triangle of sunlight on his shirt. Now if I go to the portrait mode version, you can see the wheel blurs out, which is nice, but also messed up the straw. And this triangle, which is very close, also got treated as background. So the technology is not perfect by any means. Like I say, if you look at it up close, you'll see these kinds of problems. And uh, here's another thing that changes. You'll see these stray hairs up here uh, in the uh, you know, silhouetted sky. Now here's the portrait mode version. You can see this, some of those hairs get chopped off. Sometimes that's kind of an unnatural uh, look. Excuse me. So you can see some of the problems there. So let me just go back to the regular mode. Okay, so that's a general look at the, at the portrait mode. Now to explain a little bit more about how it works, this is this is the part of this that's really fascinating to me. This is the new, this new field called computational photography. So in the old days of film, you take a photo, it would you know have a chemical reaction on the film, and that would be your data in the story. You took the photo. <coughs> With digital photography, you can have a computer that's instrumental to the process of the creation of the photo. And even you know, 10 years ago, that was the case. Uh, you you'd have some image processing that would happen when you created the JPEG image digital digital uh, file. But with each passing year, the processing gets more and more sophisticated. This depth effect in the Apple iPhone 7 Plus portrait mode is one example. The way it works is actually pretty clever. So if you, uh, it uses a little bit of parallax effect. Parallax is basically it means an object in the foreground moves more than an object in the background when you change your perspective, like shifting your head left to right. You can see uh, you can you can see how parallax works if you put your finger in front of your face and you look at it with one eye, and then you look at it with the other eye. You look at what's right, what's right behind your fingertip, and that changes the background because it looks this way with one eye, it looks this way with the other eye, so you see a slightly different background. The iPhone 7 Plus has these two cameras, and they're separated by a little gap, and that makes the perspective of each camera slightly different. That means that Apple can calculate, <coughs> excuse me, by, by judging how much the background is shifting, from one view to the other, it can gauge how far away an element in the scene is from the camera. And it builds a three-dimensional view of the scene. It's called a depth map. This is, an, this is technology that's not just Apple, this has been around for some years, this, this idea of a depth map. But basically, you get a three-dimensional view of the scene. That lets Apple decide what is the, the subject of the portrait that it should keep sharp, and what is the background that it should digitally blur. So it uses an algorithm to just to fuzz out the background. It's a pretty clever technique, and I, I, I give them big props for it. Kudos. Uh, another example of uh, computational photography is actually particularly interesting also with the iPhone 7 Plus. When I was digging deeper into this, I figured this out. Uh, sometimes when you're taking a photo, it uses both cameras at the same time. So if you're taking a photo at 1x, it uses the wide-angle camera. If you're taking a photo at 2x, it uses the telephoto camera. But what if you're at 1.5x or 1.7x? In that case, you might think, oh, it just uses the wide-angle camera and crops out the edge and does this uh, digital manipulation to expand it. And I don't want to do that. But you should actually uh, rethink with the iPhone 7 because when you take something between 1.5x and 2x, it uses both cameras. It shoots the outside of the frame with the wide-angle camera and the inside of the frame with the telephoto camera. And it composites those two together. So you're actually taking two photos with two separate cam cameras, and then you blend that together. So you get a sharper, uh, you get higher, uh, you know, crisper resolution in the central portion of the frame. It's very clever. It's something you can do uh, with because you have a computer that's handling the photos. It's, it's, I'm, it's, it's another impressive touch. So that, uh, getting to the earlier question about the problems of digital zoom, that actually is a very clever solution. So uh, you should be cautious going above 2x, but between 1 and 2x, actually, uh, it's, 
Apple does some clever tricks to improve the image quality. There are other examples of computational photography you might be familiar with if you're doing a, a panoramic sweep, that's stitching multiple frames, multiple photos together into one big photo. Uh, you can also correct for color problems, you can correct for lens problems. So for example, if you shoot in the shade, there's a lot of blue light and you take a picture in the shade, everybody, what the camera captures, everybody looks really blue. Uh, if you, uh, then you can process the image to compensate for that, so the skin tones look more natural. You also can use computational photography to correct lens optics, so the barrel distortion and the pin cushion distortion. You can apply a mathematical algorithm that backs that out so you get to parallel lines parallel again. That's really a nice feature. That's something that's been on SLRs for a few years now, and uh, it's also a part of smartphone photography, I'm quite certain at this point. So that's it's really interesting technology. I think my personal favorite example of, uh, of computational photography is a mode you probably already familiar with called HDR. Apple introduced it in the iPhone 4 way back in 2010, 2011, whatever that was. Uh, and, and they've been improving it every year since. Lots of other phones have it, cameras have it. I personally use Adobe Lightroom software to produce HDR images. The way it works is uh, when you take a photo with a camera, typically the, the, the digital image sensor can't capture both dark, shadowy details and bright highlights at the same time. That's called dynamic range, the ability to capture both of those. And it's particularly problematic with small sensors. The smaller the sensor, the worse the dynamic range gets. That's one of the reasons I shoot with a big, giant, bulky SLR, whose sensor is this big. So the dynamic range is, uh, is a problem. When you take a photo with bad dynamic range, you get washed out skies that's completely white, or you get somebody's face that's completely black if it's shadowy. High dynamic range, what it does is it takes two or three photos at different exposures and it composites them. So the photo, it, it takes one dark photo where the bright sky is exposed correctly, and then it takes one bright photo where the face in front of the, uh, the sky is exposed correctly, and then it com combines those. <coughs> and you get one photo that has a more natural dynamic range. It looks more like what your eye saw when you were there at the scene, because your eye actually has pretty good dynamic range compared to cameras, your eye and your brain. So HDR has been improving gradually over the years. There are lots of problems with HDR too. For example, the subject is moving, yet the two frames are slightly different. You get a problem called ghosting. Uh, and there are different approaches to actually how you generate the image. But in general, it's been improving significantly. And uh, I, I'm a big fan of HDR in general, building it straight into the, into the camera. Uh, so those are uh, most of the points I wanted to uh, cover with the camera. Uh, and I didn't get into the Google Pixel, but uh, if you guys have any questions on any of this. Oh, I'm sorry, there was one other thing I meant to mention. Another thing I sussed out when I was doing my in-depth reporting. I, I forgot to mention this. Uh, and this, this, this surprised me and it disappointed me. So you're aware that the, the telephoto camera isn't, it, it isn't as good in some ways as the, uh, the wide-angle camera. One difference being that it doesn't have the image stabilization. And another difference is its lens is f2.8, which means it doesn't let in as much light as the f1.8 lens, about a factor of one and a half. Uh, so, so it's a darker lens, and it's not even stabilized. So it works great if you're outdoors or if it's reasonably bright, but when it gets dark, then the camera is more susceptible to camera shake. And because it's, it doesn't let in as much light, the camera has to shoot at a higher ISO sensitivity setting to make things bright enough. And because of the, and that, I should say, when you have higher ISO settings, that means there's more image noise in, the, in your photo. You get more of those speckles. Because of those problems, Apple actually doesn't use the telephoto camera when it's dim. There are a lot of cases, I just heard, where it'll just use the wide-angle camera and digitally crop. So they have decided that that image quality overall is going to be better than the image quality you get from the telephoto lens 
uh, and a higher ISO noise setting. The higher ISO setting that brings more noise and, and that compensates for camera shake. So it's an interesting decision. I understand exactly why they did it, but it's unfortunate because I like uh, to shoot telephoto and it, I don't like the digital zoom. And so when it happened uh, and I saw that it was happening, I was, I was a little disappointed because it does detract from what is the biggest advantage of the iPhone 7 Plus over the iPhone 7. I could give some examples of how that works here. Let me get the screen sharing enabled here. Okay, so here's an example. I was at a restaurant a couple nights ago and I thought, well, let's, let's see how well this image comes out on this, on this photo. This is a uh, San Francisco ballet or outside the building for it. This is not a fantastic photo or anything, but I just wanted to see this is sort of camera testing. And I was interested in looking up at that sign that's coming. This is looking mostly straight up towards the sky. And so I thought, well, let's zoom in, go to 2x and take a picture just of that sign. So that's that. That's the 2x photo. Now, there's an interesting thing here. I don't know if you can see this, but the software I use, Adobe Lightroom, it, keep, it tracks what a lot of uh, data about the phone or camera you used. So in this case, it says 3.99 millimeters, iPhone 7 Plus back. I said, duo camera, 3.9 millimeters at 1.8. All the, the upshot of that is it means it's using the wide angle lens, which actually is a 3.9 millimeter focal length and an f1.8 aperture. So even though I was shooting it at 2x, this is still using the 1x camera and then cropping in. And if you look at it up close, you can see there are lots of artifacts. Uh, it's I mean, again, I'm not sure how all this comes through over Skype and on the projector, but the edges, the leaves are kind of smeary watercolor. The letters here on the sign, you can see the noise reduction and uh, uh, the interpolation problem. So it's not as good, and really, it's just as much data as was right here in the original that I shot at 1x. So that is kind of problem that maybe they'll be able to address later. Who knows? Uh, but it, it is a short point. Actually, this is another example. We were talking about HDR. This is a photo I took of the San Francisco City Hall. And that's the HDR version right here. So if you look at the sky, you'll notice the sky here, which is closer toward the sunset. It's not blown out and washed out. And the people in the foreground are a little bit brighter. If we go to the non-HDR image, oops, excuse me, actually the people in the foreground are dimmer in this one, but the sky is washed out. I actually don't think Apple's HDR is as good as Google's HDR, but uh, it's probably Do you have, any, do you have any comparisons? Um, yeah, actually, here's one right here. So this is an example. This is not HDR. This is a guy giving a speech. Um, and this was a, a low light shot, and you can see that he's very dark, his face is dark, his hair is very bright. If you look at this neon sign down here in the lower left corner, it's very washed out. You can see it's blue, but not much more. And, uh, and it, the focus overall is a little bit soft. Now, this is the same photo I took with the Google Pixel, and you can see that the the dim stuff here, that you can see all these details, you can see more of this neon sign. If you look at the speaker, you can see his face better, his hair is a bit more, it's not just a white patch on top of a black head. We compare that to the, this is the iPhone version, you can see it's a bit more of a bright white hair in front of a black face. Um, and actually I do have also another version of this. Uh, hold on a minute, this is going to take a second to pull up, but I took uh, I took this photo with both the Pixel and the iPhone. So here is the Pixel version of that photo. So here, let me compare this side by side here, and you can see the 
iPhone versus the Pixel oops, hang on, side by side. So on the left, you can see the Pixel version. I, you can see more of the structure in the dome. The sky is blown out. You can see a bit more of the, the structure of the people. I haven't edited these in any way, so if I edited, I might bring up the shadows more or something. You can see more of the color in the grass and the structure in the grass. And also, incidentally, you can see that the pixel has a wider angle view. That's the 24 millimeter equivalent compared to the 28 millimeter on the right with the iPhone 7 Plus. Now, I don't think that the differences are showstoppers. It's not, if, if I were an iOS person and I had all my apps set up in iOS and my account and my synchronization and all the stuff that keeps you locked into one ecosystem, that wouldn't be enough to get me to switch. I use both because it's part of my job to uh, shift back and forth and try different cameras and different software. So I'm pretty comfortable in both worlds personally. Uh, and I give the edge to the Pixel camera as long as you're only shooting wide angle. As soon as you get to that portrait mode, uh, Pixel actually has its own portrait mode. You can take a photo and you, uh, you have the subject in front of you and you move the camera up like this and that changes the perspective. It gives that parallax data so the camera can figure out what's foreground and what's background, but it doesn't work nearly as well as, oops, excuse me, I was just. Do you have a portrait uh, comparison? Uh, yeah, let me find that for you. Let's see, I think I got one from that. Where's that guy at Home Depot? Well, take me a second to find this here. I have to go through all my photos. You can see I take a lot of test photos. This is another uh, HDR morning. Okay, here we are. Okay, so this is the Google Pixel. Um, this is the Google Pixel's portrait, portrait mode equivalent, and then this is the iPhone without portrait mode, and this is the iPhone with portrait mode. Now you can see. I'm going to put these side by side here so you can compare them. You can see that the. Uh, you can see that the field of view is different because the portrait mode on the iPhone shot, which is the one on the left side, it's a telephoto lens and you have to step farther away. The field of view with the Google uh, Pixel phone, it's a, it's a wider angle lens, and so you uh, are actually standing closer to the subject when you create the photo. And when you're viewing at this level, at this zoom, it's okay, but if you zoom in, you can see a couple things. First of all, the Google phone actually downsamples, so the original resolution, you lose a lot of the original resolution. And another thing you see is there are all kinds of artifacts. The hair up here above his head is a mess. The hair on the side, is, it can't quite figure out what's foreground, what's background. The Apple, iPhone, it had some issues with the hair over here on the left side, but overall it did a better job figuring out what was foreground and what was background. Uh, so I find the, you know, it's better than nothing on the Pixel, but it's not as good. And this was actually a tough shot because it was low light conditions at the Home Depot. And so when you're shooting the portrait mode, you have to use the telephoto lens. And what that means is inevitably you, uh, because it's not as, it's not as, um, it doesn't have as bright an image as the wide angle lens, that means you get more image noise. So the portrait mode works well in good lighting condition. It doesn't work as well when it's dim. So that's it. What are the questions? Yeah, we got some questions. Back there, please. Uh, what's your opinion on some of these lenses you can clip onto an iPhone, like a 6S or something? I'm sorry, what was my opinion on what? Some of the lenses, you can buy external lenses to clip onto the oh. iPhone. Yeah, that's interesting. I shot with one uh, a, a, a year or so ago. Um, I used it for a little while. Um, 
I'm blanking on the, on the product name. Uh, uh, I, it's from Oli Click, that's O L L I C L I P. Uh, I like them. I'm the kind of guy who likes lens flexibility and I like taking photos. Uh, I like the fish, the fish eye, which gives you a super wide angle view. And I like the telephoto, which gives you a, 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 you know, a view of more distant objects. Um, I have had a problem though, which is that as with an SLR, they're a pain to use. You have to carry these things around. Changing the lenses involves a lot of fumbling, and it's not nearly as easy. It's an SLR where you, you know, you pop the button on the side and you, you know, it comes off and it goes back on. It's not as it's not as clean as that. Your cam, your uh, iPhone case, if you have one, it's kind of you have the squeeze and adapter in there, and it's it's a bit awkward. So I don't think it's, it's not as convenient as SLR. So the hassle factor, I think, is going to deter a lot of people. Uh, I think the image quality, it degrades the image quality a bit because it's not, you know, it's, it's more stuff between sensor and, and the uh, and outside world probably diminishes brightness a little bit. But overall, I think it's fine and it's, it's worthwhile. So, if the only camera you're going to carry is a phone and you want that kind of flexibility, it's a good solution. I've looked at all of them. There, there's several products out there on the market now. Interestingly, actually, OtterBox, which is one of the uh, one of the big case makers, they have a new case. I can't remember the name of it, but it's specifically designed to work with some of those lenses. So I imagine that would reduce the problem of some of the some of the fiddliness at, and because you have to insert a shim in between your phone and the case that, you know, with a tight fit, that could be really tough. But so they have a new case that's actually specifically designed for it. That would help alleviate that problem. So I kind of see them sort of as, as, I hesitate to say gimmicky. I think a lot of people will be excited and interested, but then they'll end up leaving it in the drawer at home because it's a hassle to carry it, hassle to fit lenses on to stretch the rough bands around and do the, do the the mounting. But I think it's a nice idea, and I expect that's going to be mature. There's another add-on camera from a French company called DxO, and that's a separate camera, but it's an entirely separate lens that plugs into the lightning port. And that's pretty interesting. It's a higher quality camera. So you use the uh, you use the phone screen to focus and for the interface, and but there's actually a separate camera module that takes the photo. Uh, that's Again, an interesting technology. I think most people aren't going to want to bother to carry the thing around. But if you care about photography, then that's a good way to get more bang for your buck. Uh, Sony also has some add-on lenses that, that attach to Android phones. Uh, that, uh, I'm not sure if it's a Bluetooth connection. I can't remember exactly how it works. But again, it's a sole, totally separate lens and camera that fits on your phone. And then you use your phone as the interface. And that's an even bigger, bulkier thing. You know, it sticks out like this much or something. And that'll get you even higher quality. But you know, the higher quality, the more you're moving away from the convenience of just the phone. Something will slide into your pocket. So uh, I think it's an interesting technology, and I suspect it will mature and become more useful in the future. Uh, but uh, I, at this point, still would rather. If I, I would personally rather just still carry an SLR around. I'm kind of a freak that way. But uh, uh, for the, ha the hassle factor, I'd rather have just like the easy phone and then the camera for when I, the real camera when I need more image quality and willing to put up with more bulk. Yeah, I try. I personally tried the uh, the Sony, and I absolutely positively hated it. <laughs> and uh, it was just such a pain in the butt to try to manipulate both the phone and the camera and so forth. Is there, we have some more questions. Is there a method of taking sequential uh, time photos with an iPhone, such as every five minutes or every hour? Yes. I haven't used it, but there is in the photo app um, that there is a mode called Time lapse. Time lapse. Yeah. So you can see on the bottom there, you can pick different modes, and one of the modes is time lapse. So that will let you uh, 
Oh, it's actually already on. I just started. And I think it's pretty automatic. I haven't used it. I'm not intimately familiar with how it works. Uh, but basically, the longer you take the time lapse photo, it throws more of the uh, intermediate frames away. So if you do a short one, it'll do you know pretty frequent frames. So that might be good for something where you have a crowd walking through uh, a uh, plaza or something. And you want to have the individual people. If you do a longer time lapse of a sunset, you leave the, the camera open for a long time. It throws out more of the middle frames, so you know the individual frames that in the an, in the animation are taken their space farther apart in time, their time farther apart, I should have said. And so you can get a longer time lapse. And I think I think I have used it myself, but I've, that, that's pretty automatic the way it works. So yes, that that is now an option. Peter, uh, let me just ask you a question. Peter, you're here, right? Peter Fromm? Yes. Have you used your iPhone for time lapse at all? I have not. Okay. I use one iPhone. Okay. Has anybody used their iPhone for time lapse? Okay. Next question. Go ahead. Do you recommend any third party software for picture taking? Not editing, but the picture taking. The camera plus and others. So third party software or you say picture not taking? Editing? Picture taking. For picture taking. Like camera oh, apps. Uh, uh, camera apps? Uh, well, I haven't tried them all. There are about a million of them. <laughs> everybody, everybody wants to offer something better. When I'm shooting with the iPhone, I usually shoot with Apple's camera app, which I find works pretty well. I also shoot with the Adobe Lightroom <coughs> app because as of uh, iOS 10, you can now shoot raw photos, which is the raw data that the image sensor captured before it gets processed and turned into a JPEG. If you're serious about photos, that gives you more flexibility uh, in changing color balance, in changing exposure, in applying noise reduction and sharpening. So if you're serious about photography, shooting raw can be very nice. However, I actually find that in, actually this is also the case with the Pixel, with both the Pixel and the iPhone, uh, the raw images, because the cameras do a lot of pretty sophisticated image processing to produce the JPEG, the raw images actually aren't necessarily always better. Uh, there's a lot of noise reduction the phones can do, and uh, they do a reasonably good job figuring out the correct white balance. So for me, uh, because raw adds extra processing time and doesn't offer a huge quality improvement for the smartphones, I find myself just shooting with JPEG most of the time. Sometimes I'll do both or experiment a little bit. Another app actually I've tried that I, I like is from Microsoft. It's uh, only available for the, for the iPhone, there's not an Android version of it, but it's called PIX, E-I-X. It uses some pretty sophisticated processing also. When you take a picture, it takes a burst of 10 frames and then it tries to pick the one that it thinks is best. This is increasingly common as a computational photography technique. You screen out the ones where the person is blinking, you screen out the ones with motion blur, uh, you throw those away, and then you keep the one that happens to be sharp. That's uh, a nice approach, and I think uh, Microsoft does a reasonably good job of it. It also, and this is interesting, in some circumstances, it will create a type of image called a cinema graph which is a, it's kind of trendy, and I, I like them a lot. In the cinematograph, most of the frame is still, but part of it is moving. So you might have uh, somebody holding a steaming cup of coffee, and everything in the image is completely fixed, but the steam moves up. So you have one part that moves. It's, it's compelling, it's, it's kind of hypnotic. It's like sitting by the campfire watching a waterfall or something. It's, it, it plugs into some funny part of your hind brain that uh, it, it, it's, it's it's not, it's not video, it's not a photo, it's somewhere in between the Pix app can produce those under some circumstances. So I like that app as well. A lot of people use Instagram filters. Uh, Instagram is fine, I tend not to use those myself. Uh, another popular one is uh, Visco, V-S-C-O, Visco Cam. And uh, that's popular with the creative set. Uh, so that's another one you might want to try if you, if you will like it. Personally, I just stick with the Apple camera app. Any other questions? Well, Stephen, thank you very much. Well, I'm glad.